Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, it's my honor to present the next speaker, uh, Peter Brandt. Uh, Peter was featured in the latest edition of the Market Wizards series by Jack Schwager, as you can see right here on the screen. Uh, and throughout his extensive trading career, he's produced a really stellar performance. So uh, Peter, it's an absolute pre pleasure to have you uh, here and, and a, as a part of this conference. So thank you very much for taking the time. Hey, uh, thanks Richard for inviting me. Uh, you know, I you know, appreciate the opportunity always to uh, talk to traders. It's kind of the world I've lived in. So, you know, I re relate a lot to guys who are trying to uh, make it in, in the business of market speculation. So, it, you know, it's my pleasure to be able to present to uh, your trader, trader lions. So all you trader lions out there. Hey, I'm a bit out of my element with, with most of you uh, in that I know a lot of you folks on growth stocks, you know, William O'Neill, Type guys, or, or at least momentum stocks, and you know, in terms of momentum stocks, we probably have that in common. But I'm not really a growth stock or even a stock trader. So, yeah, you, you know, I've I've put together a presentation. And you're going to kind of find it a little weird, I think. Yeah, you know, there's going to be a point at which you go, "Holy cow!" I, I, I you know, where's he going with this? Uh, you know, I'm going to spend the first part of the talk really talking about how I trade, you know, what, what's my methodology, what, you know, what goes into me seeing a trade and doing a trade, but then I'm going to take a sharp turn. I'm going to do a U-turn and I'm going to explain to you how I select trades really doesn't matter. Uh, it, 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 that it's irrelevant, that it, trade selection is a relatively unimportant aspect of, of, of the scheme of things. And, and I, I hope to be able to, in the process of doing that, bring you along in my way of thinking in terms of my journey as a trader. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of a klutz when it comes to technology, so you're going no to have to bear with this old dynasty. You know, I, I want to really kind of share with you perspectives on market speculation as a career. And I, I know a lot of you are at various points in terms of trading as a career. Some of you may be there, you're trading, you've successfully traded. I am guessing that a whole lot of you are, are still trying to figure out what that means. And, you know, you, you may just be willing to trade to supplement your income as an engineer or a truck driver or whatever it may be. And there's probably a whole lot of you that kind of likes this trading and hopes that you can make it as a career, hope that you can figure out what that looks like and how that works. Uh, so really what I want to do is kind of provide, uh, I, I, I want to provide to you uh, my decades long period of, of trading. I, you know, I started at the board of trade as a futures trader and I'm still a futures trader. I trade futures, I trade Forex and, you know, I'm, I'm a leveraged market trader. And, you know, when I started trading back in 1975, my goal was to trade my own account. I, I didn't want to be a floor broker. I didn't want to be a customer's man. I was a guy in his 20s who really became convinced that it's something that I could do that would be a cool way to make a living. You know, be a, what a cool way is I could go to the Board of Trade and I could trade and that's how I made my living. So that was really kind of my thinking at that point in time. And, you know, I, I thought it was going to be easy. I worked hard. I was relatively smart. Uh, and, you know, I'd be willing to put in the time and uh, you, you know, I could quickly learn how to do it and quickly do this. And what I found is uh, it, it was really quite a learning curve and it was a pretty steep learning curve. And, you know, I blew up several accounts during the first year of first four years of my trading. And I, I've really come to believe that that four to five years that it really takes four to five years for somebody who is pursuing market speculation to start getting a cent for the rabbit trails they need to go down. Uh, that, okay, this is kind of what it's all about for me. And for me, I just found that I found traction as a trader of classical chart patterns. 1978, that blown up accounts. I was 
three to four years into it, uh, still in my 20s. And a friend of mine introduced me to Edwards McGee. Uh, and it was something that just clicked with me. It's about classical chart patterns. This is uh, this is who I am. This just makes sense to me. It, it's something that just stuck in my mind. Said, yeah, I can, I can do this. I can do this. And of course, you know, you don't do it right away. It's a process. Even when you kind of get the scent to where you're going as a trader, sometimes it takes longer than you think to really work through all of the kinks. And you know, you clear one hurdle and think, I don't, you know, I'm in the clear. It's clear sailing and you take three more steps and you run into another hurdle and that's kind of the way it is. But finally, I really gained traction, had good years in 79, 1980. And then in 1981, I spun off and incorporated factor research and trading, you know, as a proprietary trading firm. And that was at the board of trade. And I was underfunded at first. I, I mean, I was through profits and some money I picked up elsewhere. I started the firm actually with $88,000. That, that was my account size back in 1981. My career rate of return, and I want to comment on that. I, I see people talking about compounded rate of return. I just don't, don't think prop traders should talk about compounded rates of return. And the reason is you're always, as a prop trader, pulling money out of your account. You're, you're trading as a career. You're withdrawing money. And there may be times when you put back money in, but you're putting money in, you're taking money out. You can't look at it in terms of, like in futures, the CFTC talks about VAMI. You measure performance on a VAMI basis, which is really a compounding basis. I don't think prop traders can look at it that way. And so uh jack through researching all of my documents and trading records came up with 53.5 i don't agree with that i i think it's in the low 40s i think jack overshot it and uh i've explained to him why but he's stuck with that number you know it's not been all fun and games i've had losing periods i've had four losing years during that period uh, the average of the losing year has been 6.8%. Now, you look at these numbers and you think, okay, this is great. Peter Brand's going to share wisdom of, of this performance record. And I got to tell you, you know, when you trade for a living, you don't feel very wise. And you don't feel like, boy, I get to share wisdom. You, you, you feel more like I get to share what all the scrapes and bruises and cuts and bashes to the head feel like because I, I'm convinced that one of the purposes of the market, whether the market is a thinking being or an entity, but one of its purposes of it would be is to make us traders feel stupid more often than not. And, you know, that that's kind of the, the life of a trader. And I've had plenty of cuts and bruises. And what I'm showing here is factor drawdowns that I've had over the years. On, on a month end to month end basis. And, you know, I've had a lot of 10 pluses. And if this was measured day to day or week to week, I'd probably have two or three times more dots on there. But, you know, I've had three drawdowns in excess of 30% intra year, uh, not ending year, of course. But, you know, so I, I know what it's like to eat humble pie. And, you know, I, I got to tell you, I've never gained a taste for humble pie. And anyone who has it probably doesn't have taste buds. So let me run through kind of my approach to market speculation. But I really want to do so with, with, a, with a goal in end at the end. And that's really to focus on risk and trade management, because I think that's, that's where the game is played. The game is not played by picking your trades you know what trades you put on quite frankly is relatively unimportant it's what you do with the trades you put on it's your sizing it's your trade management it's all of those things that really you know put dollars in your pocket at the end of a period of time so i, I really want to go through that you know i mentioned i'm a futures trader i'm a forex trader over the years, I've kind of started trading the macro cap cryptos, and I, I don't do that through futures. I do that through spot. Uh, I don't trade old coins, junk coins, crap coins. I trade the Ethereum or I trade Bitcoin or I don't trade anything. 
Um, you know, classical chart patterns. I focus on head and shoulders, rectangles, right angle triangles, ascending triangles, descending triangles. I hate trend lines. I hate indicators. I will trade a symmetrical triangle from time to time, uh, but I'm a chart pattern. And I, I, that's just one quick word on indicators because a lot of people get into indicators and indicator is nothing more than a derivative of price. And it's just my feeling of why would I want to study an indicator when I can study price itself? And so I want price to speak to me. I don't want indicators to speak to me. Uh, I'm a swing trader. I, I, I have a whole time of a few days to a few months. I average about uh, two new initial positions. I call them nips. I average about two entries a week in the markets I trade. Uh, you know, two and a half, somewhere in that area. I, in the past, it was a lot more. I used to trade 30 new trades a month, and now I'm pretty much down to eight to 10. I enter on ATR breakouts. I take profits at targets. When I go into a trade, my maximum risk per trade is 80 basis points, eight tenths of 1%. More often, it's 60. Uh, but I, and I've done a lot of statistical probability analysis, extensive and pretty sophisticated. I've really gotten into probability theory in recent years. And I just know from probability theory and sequencing exercises, you start risking 3% uh, of your equity on a trade, you are due to blow up. Just a couple of brief examples to show the kind of patterns I'm looking at. This is just a sample. It was, I don't know if you can see the arrow that I have there, not your head, if you can, Richard. The head and shoulders we're currently working on in the NASDAQ where we came out, we stalled a little bit, but now we're on the run. It was a head and shoulders top in corn where we went to a 1X target and then down to a 2X target where I trade tranches, where I may take a tranche off at, at a 1x, depending on the pattern, at a 1x target, I may hold for a 2x target. We've had a head and shoulders bottom, which has now failed. I didn't take the trade because I just thought there was too much resistance overhead. Uh, here was a situation where gold uh, back in 22, late 22, broke out of this big rectangle, but, but halted and failed, went right back into the pattern. I love failure patterns. You know, people talk about chart patterns don't work because they fail. Give me a failed pattern and you're really giving me something that I think has some juice on it and the sloping top that we had in the dollar index. So, you know, I love trades that get, really put a big bar through the breakout you, where you get a wide body bar and, you know, it, it makes it convincing. Uh, the, the, those are the trades I like. I, I really like patterns that are contained in a eight to 10 percentage point at the outside, 15% percentage point of the underlying value type. Now, I'm not gonna go through this. I'm just gonna show it, but I've got a grid, which gives me all the different ways that I can get signals and how I put my tranches on. You know, and it, it, you know, it has one, two, three, you know, a, a dozen, kind of cells where it says, pull the trigger, Peter. And then, you know, I have a dozen more in terms of trade management where I, I go, depending on certain things, you know, I hit a target or what happens if I get a retest? How do I move a stop on a retest? How do I move a stop on an eight day moving average, 18 day moving average? I am the rules base. I'm rules obsessed. And I want to tell you why that I, and I'll talk a little bit about emotions, but um, emotions will kill a trader. Uh, emotional management is one of the things that will take you out of the game just about as quick as anything else. I mean, some of the other big dangers is over oversizing trades, you know, FOMO. But, you, you know, given to myself, I just think most discretionary traders, especially, uh, that their emotions will sabotage them in an attempt to sabotage them at every turn. And that's why for me, it's just really important to go with my rules and to trust my rules and trust my rules through drawdowns and trust my rules through the good, trust my rules through the bad. And I know that I'll have both. And 
So, you know, I'm extremely rules based. Uh, let me just uh, make a couple of points about about charting here. Uh, and the first one is charts. I don't believe charts predict the future. You know, people talk about charts. I have it in head and shoulders. It projects prices here. I see a bottom. I'm bullish. I see a top. I'm bearish. Uh, I, if someone's doing that uh, with charts, I think they're fooling themselves. Uh, I mean, charts do not predict prices. Uh, you know, I have a 50 percent win rate, a little over fifty percent win rate. That means my, my default expectation on a trade is I'm going to be a loser. I mean, I go into a trade and when I put a trade on, I expect to lose money. And even though I have slightly more than a 50% win rate, the, 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 that's over a, when N equals a large number. That's over a large number of trades, any short sequence of trades. There was a period in 2022, it started on August 26, 2022, we're out of 20 trades that I put on, 19 were losers. And that was like a three standard deviation event. But, you know, black swans live, they exist, they come and they haunt you. What a charts do do is they show me where prices have been, so they show me where prices are, and they show me really kind of what might be the path of least resistance. I don't think in terms of certainties i don't think in terms of probabilities of a trade working i think in terms of possibilities and you know when combined with really solid risk and trade management charts indicate trades with asymmetrical reward to risk ratios so for me that's what charts are charts can identify for me when i have an edge and that's where my edge is is when a chart can give me some asymmetry but charts themselves have very little edge in and of themselves. Okay, talk about trade identification. You know, my observation on social media is that novices are obsessed with trade identification. They're absolutely obsessed. They spend their money going to seminars, they buy services that are based on trade identification. When in my opinion, trade identification might provide five, maybe 10% of the total composite of a trader's edge. And I just don't understand this obsession because that's not where your obsession is. I want to talk about other things, which I think are the big chunks of trading. There's trade management. I talk about you put the trade on. What you do with the trade is more important than the trade you put on. It's risk management, what percent of your capital, what percentage of your capital do you risk in highly correlated trades? You know, you're buying the, the QQQ, you're buying Apple, you're buying all of this. Well, you got not just eight, eight, 80 basis point risk on each one, but you add them up. That's one of the things I love about being a futures trader. I can be long European grains and uh, short rubber in Singapore and long corn and have have a gold silver spread on, and I don't have all of this composite risk that piles up on itself with 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 things from similar asset classes. I think for me that that's really one of the big advantage of trading leverage futures contracts. Uh, management of expectations and emotions. I'll talk about that in a minute. Just the process of trade management. I you know. Uh, today is June 8th, 19, uh, 2022. If I'm trading and it's a trading day on June 8th, 1923, and it's 127 in the afternoon, I, I know what I'll be doing. Uh, I know what I do at eight o'clock in the morning. I know what I do at noon. I know how when I enter my orders, how I enter my orders. I know how to recheck my orders. It's the process of trading. It's doing the same things over and over and over again. I want to talk about expectations because my observation is this is a killer. If people expect too much from the markets, you know, you double in your capital every year. You see people talking about that. I, I, I had a 20x trade. I had a 10x trade. I had a 5x trade. And let me do one more quick word on that, if I could. 
you know, when I see somebody say, I, I, I made 500% on this trade, uh, because let's say I bought a stock at $5 and I sold it at 25 bucks. You know, I think that's the wrong way to look at return. I think it's the wrong way to look at risk. I, I think that that performance always has to be measured against the total capital of an account. You've always got to look, what's your total pot of money? Not what your return on a margin is, or your return on an options trade is, or your return on an individual stock is. Always get used to measuring risk and your return against your total capital base. Or you talk about people turning five grand into a million and quitting your job and killing the market. And you see that on social media. And I think it's just, it's absolutely bogus. And so here's the reality. And I, I wanna be encouraging when I talk about this. I mean, a lot of you are aspiring traders and I wanna encourage you in that aspiration. You know, I, but there's a lot of studies and there's a lot of really good academic scholarly studies, research coming out of the CME, research coming out of some of the crypto exchanges that, you know, from day one, when a trader starts out until year five or beyond 5% of aspiring traders really reach the point where they say, this is what I do for a living. I make a comfortable living for myself. I, I, yeah, I have good years, I have bad years, but I, I, I'm a career trader. And, you know, if that's your goal, I want to encourage you in that goal. But I also want you to know that there are huge pitfalls that stand in your way from that. You got to be aware of where those pitfalls are because they're out to get you. And they're out to get you when you trade too much size, they're out to get you when you have too much composite correlated risks, they're out to get you when you start FOMOing, and they're out to get you if you don't be careful. So that's my word on that. Okay, uh, management of emotions. Uh, I talked about my emotions. If I don't, if I'm not rules-based, my emotions will carry me off in a never, never land. And so there's some practical implications to that for me. I don't enter orders during the market hours. You know, I enter orders the night before, you know, after the New York Stock Exchange closes and shortly after you get the fish, you know, that the day, end of day Globex close and gold and silver and some of these other markets, NASDAQ futures. And that's the day for me when my really my work starts. My 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 job starts when everything's closed, because that's when I look at what my positions are what my orders are, where my stops are, because I use open stops. I use you know, open order stops. I use open orders to get into trades. I couple open orders to get in with trades with attached stop orders to them. So that's when I do it. Uh, I, I may tweak those in the morning when I get up for 35 o'clock. I may take a quick look at market and tweak those. But I avoid doing any trade and pulling any triggers when the bell rings. And so uh, that's my way of kind of removing myself from the chaos of price change from the blinking screen. Then I try to remove myself. I'll go play pickleball. I'll, I, I try to bike 20 to 30 miles a day, you know, run, do my honeydew list for my wife and, you know, do things like that. But I try to avoid looking at markets during the day because I think if I looked at markets during the day and responded during the day, I think if I added up all the trades that I've done over the years uh, that were based on an emotional trigger pull during the day and added them all up, it's a negative figure. And so I need to be aware really of my best practices. Uh, you know, so then you got trade management, you got risk management. And I really want to take my remaining time here before I can get to some questions, uh, Richard, on that, because there's some key things that I, I really want to talk about here. You know, I think seven, eight years ago, I, I did a big project on probability theory with, with some guys that founded the first high frequency trading operation 
that was CRT in, in Chicago, Chicago Research and Trading. These, these were the quants and the quants. And we developed some Excel programs that kind of were what if, what if, what if, what if based on anybody that's got stable trading long-term metrics, you start plugging what if questions in. And it was uh, an Excel program that probably had 50,000 cells with formulas and very, very extensive. And well, I'll tell you, it, 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 you know, I was pretty fixed on what I thought about trade probabilities, but it was a great learning process for me. And what it, it really made me uh, understand is what what metrics when you change metrics in your trading what metrics matter what things in the process of your trading matter and you know when i hear people talking about risking three percent four percent five percent on a trade or ten percent on a highly correlated portfolio what that tells me is disaster is pending it may not be this year it may not be next year, but disaster is, is pending. And, you know, Warren Buffett's talked about his job is to avoid being destroyed. You know, you, you avoid getting whopped out as long as you avoid destruction, as long as you keep your pile of chips in place, you got a chance. You know, you, you, you may be struggling with how you're trading. You may not have everything in place. You may not have your formulas right. You may not have everything aligned. But as long as you don't self-destruct, you, you got a chance to, to get to where you are. I'm just shocked when I hear people say, golly, I lost everything in Bitcoin. I wrote it up to 60,000. I wrote it down. And, you know, that's, that's just self-destructive behavior. Um, and so you got to think in terms of not what your next trade is and not your win rate. I, I, you know, a win rate is nothing more. It's the most overrated metric in the world is your win rate. Your, your, your win rate is, is nonsense. And what matters is what's the ratio of your win size to lo lose size. That, that's the only thing that matters. But your job as a trader is to manage losses. Your job as a trader is not to find profits and find the big winners. You will pay off as a trader when you manage losses because it doesn't matter who you are. George Soros, it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, Michael Marcus, Bruce Kovner, Paul Tudor Jones, you're gonna have losses. You gotta manage the losses. You have to have the emotional ability to take losses and stride. Because your ability to take losses in stride is a real marker for trading success. You got to be able to say, hey, that's a loss. Move on. You're throwing mud at a wall. Some clump stick, a lot of them slide. You move on. Because losses really are just part of the process to find winners. At least that's been the case to me. Now, when I came into trading, and I, I want to dwell on this for about five, ten minutes, you know, the old timers, you hear from the old timers at Board of Trade. Now, this is 75. So the old timers at the time were guys that were veterans of World War II. I, I mean, the, the, you know, the, these were guys that you know, were born in 1910, uh, for goodness sakes, and they were still in the pit. But what they all said is, is you know, you got to cut your losses short. You got to let your winners run. And you, we give lip service to that. And everybody says that, but you really do it. What does it really mean? What does it really mean when you execute this idea day by day, trade by trade, week by week, month by month, cut losses short, what winners will win? And, uh, you know, it's an adage that um, really took me, I think, five to 10 years to really appreciate and have become embedded in my DNA is to just accept that these old timers were right. And I think all traders that come in have a way of fighting this, but eventually they come around to it. I want to introduce you to, uh, to Vilfredo Pareto, who was an Italian economist, philosopher back in the 1800s, who came up with the Pareto principle. And you're, you're all aware of it. You know, it's this 80-20 rule, right? 
is 20% of the people in a church do all the work. 20% of the employees in a company produce most of the most of the profits and most of the good things. You know, 20% of events produce 80% of effect. And no matter where you go in life, you will find the 80, the Pareto principle rules. Now there's some big deep math behind the Pareto principle, but just look at it in terms of a principle without really getting into it. So really it applies to every discretionary trader. Every discretionary trader I've ever met, there is an exception, guys that are short gamma. And guys that are short gamma are just recipes for future disaster. But for every discretionary trader I've ever met, I've said, go back through your entire trading history. Go back through every trade you've ever done if you have the records. Add them all up. You will find that 20% of your trades or 15% of your trades or 10% of your trades produce 80, 85, 90% of your profits. I've never had anybody come back to me and say, Peter, I'm a discretionary trader. I'm not a short gamma trader, but Pareto principle doesn't apply to me. Anyone I've ever told that to, I've never heard someone say it doesn't apply. And the fact that it applies is really, I think, the most deeply embedded principle of the way that I approach markets. Because for me, 80 to 20% of my trading events count for 80 to 90% of my net profits. You're in, you're out. You're in, you're out. It just doesn't fail. Now, that fact is a big tell for let your profits run, cut your losers short. Because Pareto trades generally act differently if not interfered with. Let me tell you, you get into a trade, bang, day one, your profit never looks back. Maybe it comes back and it kisses your entry point two, three days later. Maybe it has a closing loss for a day or two but it doesn't put you under, it doesn't challenge you, but then it moves. And so I have found not only do 20, 10 to 20% produce net profits, but when I go back every year and look at those trades, what I found is that they're winners. They're winners from the get-go. Now, some of them may be a little bit challenging, but not big losses. They don't put me underwater. They don't put me in the sweat. And that's a really, really important thing because what it does is the challenge we have, how our Pareto trades achieve. You know, when I go into a trade, my goal for a trade is a 200 basis point profit. For me, a Pareto trade is a trade that delivers 200 or more basis points of profit. And at the end of the year, when I add up the 80% of my profits are represented by trades that were 200 basis point profits, 300 basis point profits, sometimes 400. Every you know four or five years, I get a thousand basis point hit. But for the most part, that's where they are. But importantly, there are trades that were tempting for me along the way to get out. You know, at Gull, I take a 19 out of 20 trades were losers. The next trade I have on that moves to a hundred basis point winner, I am I am just itching to take it. I'm itching to put something in the bank. But those are the ones you got to just have anxiety for. And for me saying, I'm willing to let them go back to break even. You know, if they go back to break even, yeah, I'll blow out. But I'm going to leave them be until I at least get to a 200 basis point profit. Then I have some decisions to make. If they hit their targets. And usually my targets represent the way I size trades about a 200 basis point. But then the question is how to deal with the 80% so that are break even. Because if you have 80% of your trades, 20% of your trades representing 80% of your profits, that means that 80% of your trades are basically break even. And how do you get 80% of your trades and not to eat in to the gains that you made in the 20%? And that's where the bottom line is. That's where your shoe lever touches the ground and uh, th th that's what matters for me. So I just want to go through the metrics that for me uh, matter. And people talk about win rates. They talk about rate of return. What a nonsense metric is rate of return. Who cares what your rate of return is? If you're profitable, you're profitable. Rate of return. I don't want to hear anyone tell me what their rate of return is. It's meaning sharp ratio is a big joke. 
you know, but it's a joke that family offices all all embrace is what's your sharp ratio? And that's nonsensical. As for me, I am penalized. When I get a 300 basis point winner, I get penalized on my sharp ratio. It penalizes traders that make most of their money based on the Pareto principle, which rules trading. And so the sharp ratio is nonsense. So for me, cross them out. I want to wear, what's your worst loss? Big metric. In our programming, our probability program, worst loss is a huge metric. What's your worst loss in basis points, in basis points? You've taken a 500 basis point hit on the loss. That is bad news. And so I want my worst loss during the course of the year to be maybe a hundred basis point hit. Profit factor. You know, if you don't know what profit factor is, Google it. You can find out what profit factor is. If you have a profit factor over one during the course of the year, it doesn't matter what your rate of return is because you will be profitable. Gain to pain ratio. It has some mathematical equivalencies to profit factor, which the math will show you. What's your gain to pain ratio? How much pain do you have to go through to get your gain? Jack Schwager also wrote a book called Market Sense and Nonsense. And Jack is the master of metrics. And if you don't have the book yet, it goes through all of the performance metrics that are out there. Uh, there are some wonderful performance metrics, and they're not the ones that the, most of the people on the street look at. Kelmar ratio kind of is a rolling ratio of drawdowns to your, your annual, and usually look at it on a three-year or five-year basis. And of course, the Pareto effect. That's a metric that I will look at every year is what percent of my trades did, what percent of my net profit. That's that's a record. This goes back to 2014 for the factor prop account, which is the company's trading account. And I, I look at some of these things where, you know, over the course, uh, my average gain has been 66 basis point. My average loss has been 16 basis point. Uh, my ratio of win to loss size 4.2, my profit factor 5.4. If you have a profit factor of three, you're world-class. You're getting into world-class. Two is excellent. One is profitable. Uh, and then the percent of, of my total profits that come from the 15 largest profits I have, and that's been about 80. These are the metrics to me that really matter. And it all comes back, how do you figure out a way to cut your losses short how do you figure out a way emotionally and in rules terms to let your profits run? And what does it mean to you to cut your losses short? What does it mean to you to let your winners run? So, hey, Richard, the time left is yours. Awesome. Peter, thank you so much. Uh, I, I really enjoyed this and I, I think it emphasizes a lot of key points for everybody watching.